Um, my, my presentation is a bit more on the policy side. I mean, because it focuses mainly on, on resettlement and complementary pathways uh, to, to the EU and the global compact. So I'll try to, uh, to give a summary of where we come from and where we, we, we are going and also the state of play as of today at the EU context. Um, so you have the, the structure here. Okay, so uh, just to go back to 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 recalling the, I mean the, the the main objective of the global compact and the key principle. As we know, the global compact objective was to bring together states and a wide range of other actors to agree on a common plan. The global compact has four objectives. Uh, you have to ease the pressure on the host countries, enhance refugee self-reliance, expand access to third country solution, including resettlement, and support condition in country of origin for return in safety. Um, it's important to recall some of the guiding principle of the compact as a for, for, for this presentation, but also, I mean, to set up the scene and where we are going. The global compact on refugees, um, I mean, one of the main key principles is to enhance solidarity and responsibility sharing through international cooperation, even if the instrument, as we know, is not per se binding. However, it rests on principles that are enrooted in international law provision. And it's also the expression of the political will and the ambition of the international community as as a whole, it expresses solidarity with refugees and with affected host countries. The compact per se also tries to operationalize the principle of burden and responsibility sharing to better protect and assist refugees and to support also host countries um, that are hosting and receiving the largest number of refugees. This is in line with the mention in the preamble also of the 1951 convention that the very act of providing protection to refugees may place indeed a heavy burden on certain countries. But when a host countries, uh, when a country hosts a large number of refugees, it may put a strain indeed on the state's capacity to provide protection and to provide assistance to refugees. It is then that, that the international community and the relevant stakeholders have to come in and have to assist. Such assistance and support to the refugee hosting country will then permit also to expand the protection space. If there is no burden sharing, no taking responsibility by the international community, this may result to putting at risk the protection space and it may link to shrinking the protection space as well. So the global solidarity and support to host country will benefit refugees, it will alleviate the burden and will improve the quality of the protection. It will also support and recognize efforts of the local community and the host countries. If we look at another key aspect of the compact as operationalizing also the global solidarity, the aim is to improve protection outcomes through inclusion into national systems and development of socio-economic inclusion of refugees with access to labor market, to job creation and the creation of entrepreneurship programs. We must keep in mind that, of course, the recommendation on inclusion in the compact is not as a way to externalize or to protect externalization of refugee protection, of course. Focuses on inclusion is primarily because majority of refugees are in some host countries, mainly developing countries, providing protection to a large number of refugees. The international community must play its part to alleviate the burden and to share the responsibility, as we have mentioned. So the global compact objectives are not to be seen in isolation. I think that point is important. The four objectives are interdependent, indivisible, while the inclusion of refugees in national system has to be promoted. At the same time, the international community must also continue to contribute to find solution and to enhance protection space for refugees. So the global compact calls for the international community to assist with solution, to assist with resettlement, to assist with repatriation when the condition, of course, allow it in safety and dignity. So if we look also at the, the compact, and I think that's an important approach as is also reflected in some of the instruments today uh, in the pact, is the multi-stakeholders approach and a participative approach. Uh, states are at the center, they are leading the discussion, and an important role is played by other actors, civil society, NGOs, individuals, academia, but also refugees themselves. Participatory 
um, participation of refugees is key. Um, last point as well is the development approach. I mean, we have to keep that in mind, especially also in the context of the inclusion uh, objective. Um, so it is preferable, of course, to focus on providing protection and assistance to refugees with or I mean through a development approach rather than only a humanitarian approach. Um, that's more viable in the long term, it's more sust sustainable in the long run. And um, I mean, focusing only on the humanitarian approach has always a, the, a risk of, of course, creating parallel systems and uh, that are not beneficial and sustainable at the end. So um, going now to the three-year strategy, three-year strategy on resettlement and complementary pathways. So um, it was mandated under the Global Compact. It was launched uh, last year in July 2019, just a few months before the first Global Refugee Forum held in December uh, of the same year. The Global Compact on Refugees promotes, as uh, we have seen, in solidarity, responsibility sharing, but particularly here through the three-year strategy um, by emotions, both in terms of resettlement opportunities as well as complementary pathways. The strategy aims of resettling 1 million uh, individuals by 2028 and to facilitate solution for an additional 2 million individuals through complementary pathways. The strategy has three goals for the for seeking solution for, for refugees. First goal being to grow resettlement. We're looking at increasing resettlement, but in terms of places, in terms of scope, in terms of size, in terms of quality as well. The second objective, as you see on the slide, is to advance complementary pathways, to improve access and develop opportunities. We'll, uh, we'll see that um, while the resettlement is an important tool to meet the protection needs and is the preferred tool as well um, to meet the um, to respond to vulnerable refugees, complementary pathways as well can expand third country solution and they can ease also the pressure on, third, on host countries. Uh, the third objective, which is build the foundation, um, promotes solidarity, diversity and openness, all elements that are essential for resettlement and complementary pathways to grow. Uh, the arrival of refugees can trigger positive uh, dynamic social and economic changes and promote also social cohesion. So uh, that third objective has been of particular focus now in the last few months during COVID. Now, looking at COVID and the impact on refugees and operation, we have um, seen that this year, I mean, UNHCR has reported that nearly 80 million refugees and other forcibly displaced uh, have been reported, a number that is unprecedented and has been rising. Majority of refugees are, in, are hosted in low income and developing countries. I mean, we have Uganda, Bangladesh, Pakistan, also Turkey. Um, in Europe, I mean, we have Germany being, being hosting a large number of refugees. But at the Global Refugee Forum uh, held last year, we have more than 1,400 pledges that were made and which are concrete demonstration and evidence of the solidarity that exists. Just a few months after the first Global Refugee Forum, the ambition and the optimism and the dynamism were a bit tested by, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Pandemic has touched all individuals and countries and affected the most vulnerable, including refugees. For UNHCR, these last few months have been unprecedented in terms of challenges and imagine in the field and try to adjust protection delivery and find solutions for refugees. Today, actually, it may be a time where the global compact on refugees and the principles um, in it remain fully relevant or even more relevant. And um, the, the current crisis is, is, is testing solidarity and responsibility sharing. We have not one health crisis only, we have also an economic crisis and a protection crisis, as 
it was mentioned by, by the UN Secretary General recently, the virus does not distinguish between status, nationality, access to health services does not depend on citizenship or admission, visa, permits or condition. The COVID-19 has shown also how fragile some systems can be, especially health services have faced major challenges. And today, I mean, the pandemic reiterates the importance to include all refugees in education, as well as to allow access to employment, to include them in social services, as well as give them access to social assistance, safety nets, and so on. It's more than ever important. When we look at the COVID-19 related measure adopted by government over the, la over the last few months, uh, this has been debated and raised by, by uh, several speakers already, we see mixed practices. I mean, we have seen some best response and then we have seen some detrimental response with blanket denials of access to territory or access to asylum procedures. Um, we have seen though some positive uh, experience as well and response, like for instance, uh, Indonesia, uh, allowing 300 Rohingya to disembark in Aceh. Um, in, sorry, I'm changing the slide. So in terms of the impact, I mean, UNHCR has here, you have the dashboard. I mean, UNHCR has put a lot of attention in the last few months in gathering information, in monitoring, identifying best practice trends, to try to measure the impact of the pandemic on refugees and to demonstrate generally the effectiveness or not of action and work in the field. UNHCR also has developed this dashboard where you can find different uh, data to inform policy and decision making. At the end of the pandemic, 168 countries fully or partially closed the border, 90 making no exception for people seeking asylum. Today, 113 countries have shown that there are ways to resume the asylum system, where some 63 countries have now, now resumed fully and partially. Countries have been creative also by adopting remote digital technology for registration, remote interviews, uh, processing on dossier basis, flexible timeline for documentation as well, um, for visa application and so on. In the middle of, of this crisis, we have also seen a continued uh, generosity and uh, countries welcoming and taking care of refugees. I mean, we can think of Bangladesh, Turkey as well hosting close to 4 million refugees. Um, we have, of course, in our recent advocacy efforts, UNHCR has recalled the need to, to ensure that there is no externalization of the asylum processes to third country. This is, of course, at the center of our advocacy always, and to countries that are already, um, that, that the process is not externalized and, and transferred to countries that are already protecting thousands of refugees. Um, in terms of the economic crisis now, uh, we are just at the beginning. I mean, we have seen, as you know, refugees are relying on informal economy and they certainly have been among the first to feel the economic impact of lockdowns. Many have lost their job. Many have been evicted from their homes. Children have dropped out of school. Um, we have, and we are recording, uh, increased number of protection incidents in the field. We have seen many refugees who are not able to offer any more education or allow the children to go to school. The economic impact is significant on the economic front for families. It has led to um, increase also of early marriage, um, negative coping mechanism as well in some families. Lockdown have increased family tension. Uh, we have seen as in uh, the global context as well, but we have seen an increased number of domestic violence and SGBV uh, reports incident. The crisis had also an impact in bringing more tension and increased number of incidents in terms of discrimination, stigmatization, tensions with with uh, with some some host uh, communities as well. Uh, this being said, we have also seen some some positive aspects and or some reprioritization during the COVID. I mean, some projects such as the cash assistance, for instance, the cash assistance delivery has been prioritized in many operations as one of the way to assist and, and, and try to respond to the immediate needs of refugees. 
Um, also, I mean, we are promoting and looking at possibilities to include uh, and mainstream refugee inclusion into health systems. That's a priority. Same thing as well for advocacy to include as much as possible refugee children in national education systems. And um, in terms of the multi-stakeholder approach and the local implementation have been also brought to the forefront during the crisis. One lesson that we have learned uh, among many of the COVID emergency is the importance of the local community as first responders. They are often best placed to provide emergency support to the forcibly displaced and they have been also assisting uh, enormously uh, again in, in the crisis. Um, now, in terms of more focusing on resettlement and, and in the EU context now, in this global context, uh, just explain. Um, you will see here on the slide, I mean, that resettlement needs are important. I mean, we are, we are recording more than 1 million point four people in need of resettlement. Uh, you can see uh, the details of, of the various region mentioned on the on the map as well. The COVID pandemic has placed a significant obstacle to, to, to secure a third country solution for refugees in 2020 and going into 2021 as well. I mean, the border closure, the travel restriction have necessitated IOM and UNHCR to place a temporary hold on resettlement departure. UNHCR staff around the world uh, did struggle, I mean, did manage to maintain resettlement activities due, um, through remote and uh, innovative methodologies. But I mean, uh, of course, they were confined as, as all of us. Um, in the, sorry, next slide, you will see also the, the statistics. So you have in the first column the statistics as of 2020, uh, end of August and 2019. This can give you a bit the scope of, of the problem in terms of how COVID has impacted uh, the resettlement program this year. Despite the challenges um, we have managed, as you can see, to still provide uh, uh, submissions to, to resettlement countries with 26,000 and that that continued quite intense I mean importantly during during the the lockdowns so that was a positive aspect um, some refugees also managed to be evacuated um, I mean resettled and admitted on emergency uh, basis um, not many but uh, some some few of them units here on the ground also continued the interview processing and the case processing with some innovation and innovative modalities such as video interviews, remote processing modalities were adopted. And since uh, June 2020, UNHCR and IOM have announced the lifting of temporary hold on departure and since have been working very closely with member states uh, in the EU and, and others to resume as soon as possible admissions for resettlement. Um, as of now, I mean, the bar admission have resumed, but in slow number, depending on uh, different countries' limitation and, and possibilities, but we are close to 12,000 uh, person for this year. Now, looking, the slide is a bit heavy, but I mean, it shows you a bit where we stand on the implementation of the three-year strategy. Um, so many states have supported the three-year strategy um, and in addition to resettlement i mean we're looking at of course regular offering regular pathways with labor mobility education community sponsorship and family reunification process programs uh, the three-year strategy is mandated under the global compact as i have explained and as we can see on the slide here following the launch of the three-year strategy in 2019 we had uh, the global refugee forum at the end of the year and 78 pledges related to resettlement and complementary pathways were made by states and organization after one year um, it's important to take stock of the achievement and where we stand today and that's this that slide is a is an attempt to summarize where we are um 
so basically the after the grf there was an action plan that was issued and established by march 2020 and it's basically uh, taking the concrete action and concrete activities and also keeping track on the progress on the implementation of the pledges the global action plan is a living document so um, it can be adjusted and different stakeholders are participating in the process. UNHCR does not really take the lead, but several state organizations are in the lead in the in leading the three-year strategy implementation. It's not a UNHCR uh, strategy. Well, some, some people refer to the UNHCR strategy. No, it's a multi-stakeholder strategy. And actually many states are leading the discussion of um, in, in that strategy. An important uh, aspect is that by fall, we should have also a midterm report. So by, by the end of, uh, of this year, we will do a midterm report of the action and the very concrete achievement in the strategy. One of the achievements is, for instance, that in 2019, uh, we had met the resettlement targets in terms of admissions with more than 60,000 persons admitted um, globally. Um, another aspect is also, as you can see on the slide, for instance, we are working very closely uh, with the OECD to collect data and try to identify also pathways that can be used by refugees, including pathways such as labor, education or family reunification pathways. Um, a concrete aspect and achievement is also, for instance, the first education task force that was, uh, I mean, the education task force on education the, the sorry the task force on education was established and met recently um already twice actually this year so that's um promising as well we have uh, portugal in the lead and also the european european commission participating um there will be also a state-led family reunification network that will be established soon and also we expect to have uh, important discussion in that context. Uh, Labour Mobility Task Force as well is planned or in the pipeline and um, will be co-chaired by, by Canada. So that's also good. Um, there are also other important achievements under the three-year strategy. Uh, of course, the number have been low as, a, as we have uh, seen. So that's a serious concern for us in and uh, for the years to come as well. I mean, we need to ensure a certain number of, of persons to be resettled. Uh, and for this year, the, the target will not will certainly not be met. One important aspect, which is at the bottom of the slide uh, here, it's, it's uh, the um, involvement, the increased interest as well in community sponsorship with um, different projects that have emerged in Europe. Uh, we are working very closely I and mean, we are part of the Global Refugee Sponsor Initiative, which is a GRSI, to develop community, sp community sponsorship model. Community sponsorship are there to assist and help in the integration of resettled refugees, but also, I mean, to assist and help on any other pathway. So it can be as it can, it's a modality basically, it's not a pathway per se, but it's a very interesting concept and we are working very actively on that. The government of Canada also for, for information has announced recently the goal that they have set up a program to admit 500 refugee families, um, which will be coming on economic labor mobility pathway. So that's also an achievement. Uh, additionally, also to mention, I mean, uh, the faith-based organization initiatives such as San Egidio, FCE, uh, many initiatives uh, among other in France, but also in Italy. I mean, many in Italy was the humanitarian corridors that has been very successful. And now they have also opened university corridors with f uh, first few students who just arrived, so university level. Um, so that's for the three-year strategy where we stand as of today and now a few slides on on the pact and a discussion on the eu context um so as i mean already mentioned by many speakers i mean the pact was recently issued uh end of september with a non-legislative commission recommendation on legal pathway to protection in the eu the pact 
explicitly refer to the Global Refugee Forum and the, the UNHCR three-year strategy. So that that's that's a positive uh, aspect. Um, it calls on EU member states to take a global leadership role on on resettlement and counter the current trend of decreasing number of resettling countries globally and a sharp drop in resettlement pledges. Um, as mentioned as well, uh, the pact. Uh, takes a comprehensive approach with a puzzle piece that I'm sure we have seen this slide earlier. Um, so, but all elements are interlinked. So it's it's important to keep that in in mind and that together, I mean, they form the pact. The resettlement remains a priority. It's in the center of of that puzzle. If 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 we see as well. Um, the Commission calls for an increase, I mean, in the recommendation, they call for an increased role of the EU and recommends to member states to increase their resettlement pledges and call also to expand complementary pathways. So there is, uh, in the recommendation part of the pack, there is very strong call from the Commission to expand uh, both resettlement and complementary pathways and to establish itself as a leader in the resettlement. Um, However, I mean, the Commission also recommendation explains the impact of the pandemic and the low arrivals in 2020 with 4,200 individuals that arrive only uh, so far. And due to the pandem pandemic and also due to other consideration, um, we have seen that here they are basically extending the the 2020 pledges implementation period to 2021 to allow some flexibility to member states to meet the commitment this has raised of course some some issues and a lot of discussion um the commission i mean uh, beyond that point the commission also is looking at working very closely with UNHCR in terms of priority areas. So, I mean, they have defined the priorities areas as uh, as in the past, I mean, the three main priority situation that uh, the program will be oriented to will be Syrians uh, from Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, but also other countries, Egypt, uh, Central Med, of course, and um, also other countries where the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework has been launched, uh, can be Uganda, Kenya, and uh, Ethiopia, and, and, and other countries uh, in, in Africa. Um, the Commission also foresees in the recommendation an increased role of EASO um, with um, also assisting with, for instance, a refugee support facility in Istanbul. Um, in the recommendation, it's interesting to note that, I mean, it's the first time basically that the, 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 um, the Commission is calling for member states to to expand and, and to look at uh, other programs. Uh, family reunification is uh, well mentioned was uh, as a priority, assistance uh, for family members to exercise their right in line with EU law, but to expand also the scope of family members, beneficiaries beyond what is provided in the directive and, and have a more um, um, like, uh, I mean, generous approach in terms of, uh, of, of interpretation. The recommendation also uh, asks to look at other pathways such as, as labor mobility and education pathways. I mean, labor mobility and labor inclusion also. I mean, it com comes back in, in different aspects of the pact. Uh, I'm sure you have you have noted a strong emphasis on on labor mobility in general, but also as complementary pathways. Uh, there are some first technical meeting was organized last week by the Commission on such pathways and inviting different countries to come and share the experience as well. So Canada was there, for instance, to, to present the economic labor mobility pathways that they have just established, talent beyond boundary. France was there also to, to present a post program, which is for researchers at, at risk. So uh, important initiatives they are taking place. Um, the Commission also has reiterated that they will support financially uh, with some calls for proposal. I think one is to be launched in the coming days or has been launched today for complementary pathways and integration. Um, important aspect here as well is a uh, community um, sponsorship program. Such programs are 
essential, I mean, our priority for, for the Commission, uh, also to support resettlement, complementary pathways, but also integration. And the Commission is looking at adopting a European model of community sponsorship. Now, I'm running a bit out of time, but this is my last slide. Yeah. Um, so, UNHCR now, um, as regard to the pact, I mean, of course, we are still in an analysis mode. I mean, we, uh, the pact, as you know, is, is extremely uh, comprehensive. I mean, it's 450 pages, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we have, uh, we are still uh, looking, looking and analyzing uh, the different aspects of the pact. But, I mean, looking at what we have discussed just now, I mean, we can welcome the pact as an effort from the Commission to reiterate its commitment to solidarity. I mean, we are in a challenging time of emergency with COVID-19 and a deep economic crisis in perspective. And it's it's um, good to acknowledge the efforts of the Commission to issue the pact and advance on refugee protection. Um, on the pact itself, I mean, there is, of course, UNHCR, um, we, we, approach, we appreciate, sorry, the approach, the rationale um, behind the pact. I mean, uh, the key principles are there. Um, but of course, I mean, the numbers for 2021 was a concern and has been discussed with, with the Commission and, and with member states as well. Uh, we understand COVID uh, impact, of course, and we understand the delays that uh, were caused uh, due to the MFF negotiation. But um, I mean, we we are advocating for more places. I mean, refugees uh, re refugee needs in the field are increasing. I mean, the protection with COVID uh, protection incident have increased. I mean, definitely more resettlement place is. Uh, necessary, I mean, and essential for the protection of refugees. So we have asked the Commission and Member States to remain ambitious and to reach a maximum. Um, we need to keep in mind also our overall goal of trying to increase protection accessibility while we mitigate also the negative aspect of irregular migration um, and that people will put themselves at risk uh, if they don't have access to um, to procedures uh, and more easy access to procedures as well. So that's that's also important. Um, of course, uh, one of our key message is that resettlement should not be conditional to the implementation of readmission agreement or be activated only at time when asylum seekers have reduced in a particular member state, if I can put it that way. So that, that's, that's, of course, uh, one of the central message that we want to keep with not only in the Euro Europe context, but I mean, in all contexts, of course. Now for UNHCR, it remains important to, for the EU to lead the pact and to show the good example for credibility and solidarity with member states, uh, with states, sorry, hosting large number of refugees. I mean, increasing the number of resettlement place will build the trust with other countries and other program and expanding the, um, the resettlement will definitely uh, alleviate also the, the burden on member states, on other states, sorry. Um, see, I run out of time. Um, yeah, when, when we are talking about resettlement as part of uh, uh, the use of resettlement here, I mean, it's also part of the bigger picture of the protection strategy. I mean, we are focusing on pro providing higher quality refugee protection to refugees in their original location, uh, hosting location. And of course, the, the scale of resettlement in order to have the trust and serious engagement with states has to be in a higher scale. So it means, I mean, the numbers have to be, to be important. This goes back to, to the four objectives of, of the Global Compact, and it's not only I'm acting on one or on another. I mean, they are all interlinked, and they all have um, a, a relation with each other. The predictability as well is one of our key message. Uh, UNHCR has engaged in the last year on discussion with on the Union Resettlement Framework. I mean, uh, we have issued comments already in this respect, recalling also additionality of, of complement. I mean, in terms of uh, resettlement and complementary pathways, conditionality. I mean, a few aspects I have already mentioned, and we look forward to resuming discussion on the Union Resettlement Framework. Um, 
we see positive aspect on complementary pathways being reflected in the pact and recommendation, but it is essential that uh, complementary pathways remain additional to resettlement and are not a substitute to resettlement. Protection through resettlement remains for units here the best pathway. It is based on, on protection consideration and for refugee in the most vulnerable situation. Not we, we know that refugees do not have the same protection risk and problems in a certain uh, hosting country. So the protection environment and space in the country of asylum may be different. So we need to select and identify the most vulnerable in that environment, in that hosting countries. Some complementary pathways like labor and education are not targeting necessarily the most needed refugees. So we have to keep that in mind. I mean, they might be the most skilled or the most with the most experience, but we need to remain con conscious on what resettlement can achieve and what opportunities complementary pathways can provide for refugees. So the additionality is very central here and we need to keep in mind the protection, the protection function of resettlement. Um, I will conclude now with, I mean, just very briefly, just to say that, yeah, I mean, overall, I mean, 2020 has been a year where international standards and refugee protection, refugee, I mean, our work as UNHCR has been uh, tested, severely tested. Resettlement programs have been no exception. Um, but we see also some positive uh, since August. I mean, states have resumed departure and missions. So, I mean, we, we are seeing uh, positive progress there as well. As, um, as I mentioned, we are facing not only one crisis, but I mean, three crises, um, health, the pandemic, but also, I mean, the economic crisis and, and the protection, general global protection crisis affecting the most vulnerable and affecting the refugees. So is, I mean, the question was a bit, is the global compact still relevant? Yes, it's more relevant today than, than ever, actually, I mean, and for future crises as well. I mean, it provides a vision, it provides a strategy to meet today's challenges. But we have seen in the last few months that the pandemic is affecting all of us. We have seen the, the, the consequences in terms of loss of lives of uh, over 1 million people and more than 30 million uh, persons infected. So the pandemic has one important thing. I mean, the, it has showed also like the importance to work together and it has put to the forefront, I mean, the, the, the principle of solidarity and 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 uh, responsibility sharing, the need for partnership, uh, the need, the importance of local communities and uh, to respond, solidarity also. Um, so the crisis has also asked us to work in a more creative and innovative manner, and we have to change the way we see uh, also our work and how we proceed. And um, yeah, I mean, it's basically, I mean, the relevance of, of, of the compact is definitely there. And we have seen that with a political will and, uh, and collaboration of few states, and I mean, many, several states, sorry, we can find a way to respond to this emergency, but also to future emergencies. Okay, thank you very much. I will stop here. Sorry, I've been a bit too long. <laughs>